think after the election, I, like many people, were pretty upset about the, uh, you know, future of our city kind of being a bit stalled. I just felt really angry. And I think I felt kind of a despair. And, you know, it wasn't just me, but it was a lot of people. I, I think I, but I know for myself, I was certainly like kind of lashing out. And I think some people close to me kind of checked me on that and were like, you know, you realize when you say this, it kind of hurts me. I think I felt like very paranoid to a degree about like what was going on. I got some texts from anonymous numbers that were like not super nice. um, And that freaked me out. And so I was kind of like, I just think I need to lay low. I think I need to get out of politics. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. Live. We're not live. You know that you know that Wedge Live podcast is not actually live, right? Well, I mean when you oh well the podcast, yes. I was like when you tweet it's live, it's some sometimes it's live and sometimes I like to watch a YouTube video when it's already done. And sometimes I pause. I pause a lot to like make sure I've got what's actually happening. And so mm-hmm. I will my live tweets will end up like half an hour behind the actual event. And I'm worried that like this is fake news. People think it's happening now and it's actually <laughs> this is what happened 30 minutes ago that I'm experiencing for the first time. So I, I don't know what the ethics of that are. How, how do you interpret the ethics of that? Live tweeting something that's on a, like a 30 minute delay cuz you paused YouTube. Considering that normally you're getting news like the professional big news corporations are like usually reporting things a good 15 minutes to days late and <laughs> usually misconstruing this, uh, the uh, facts as we saw with, um, was it Reuters or something that said like that the Ward 10 convention was a Minneapolis oh. city council meeting, you know, that was, that was, uh... I think, I think you're, you're, you're probably, Ethically, I'm not a journalist, so I don't really know. But okay, well, that <laughs> was the today. That was a Today Show that blamed the Minneapolis City Council oh, for the. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wasn't Wedge sure Live... which, which news source it was. But Wedge Live has been indirectly featured on the Today Show, so I'll put that on my resume. Uh, okay, we're here. It's the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. My guest is Luna Zeidner. Uh, Luna Luna was campaign manager for Sheila Najad's 2021 mayoral run. So uh, before we get going, you, uh, the way I convinced you to do this is I said, uh, if it goes poorly, we could just throw it away and forget it happened. And then you tweeted about it and asked for suggestions for what we would talk about. So now we have to put it out. Yeah, I know. People are going to be disappointed. Um, So I guess I wanted it to be good. I wanted it to be something that people would like listening to. Um, The last time I did a podcast was right after the election. I was on the podcast. the money power land solidarity uh podcast which uh sadly is no longer um as of like february um and that was like their kind of reflection on the election episode uh and that was that was kind of intense because it was like a week after everything was still really raw so now that it's you know that's kind of settled into the background a lot like i've lived a whole other life since then (laughs) I huh? still think about I still think about it. Uh, I feel like I'm still living with 2021. I think what yeah. I did for the Wedge Live podcast, I think I took a long break. I feel like I just like set a lot of things to the side and like didn't want to think about it for a while. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. I don't remember that uh, two months of my life after the 2021 election. Me, uh, me neither. I I think I mostly caught up on sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's talk about this these painful memories that we have uh what looking back at 2021 what did we learn what was gained what was lost do you think uh well i think we really lost um the opportunity to and this was really like the core message of the sheila for the people campaign was um you know that the city needs to be run more democratically we need to be 
including people in a more authentic process um, that actually engages them. It's not just collecting like the same 20 community voices that are like the business powers of downtown, you know, um, we need to get more input past the Steve Kramers of the world and, you know, various nonprofit leaders. We need to talk to people who are like just, you know, going to the grocery store and, uh, you know, on the street waiting for a bus. Like, you know, those types of people are um, the people who you never hear from because they're not going to uh, city meetings. And, and I think we we were really trying to bring those people into the process. And I think um, with the outcome of the election being that, you know, we're not going to have this more community based um holistic public safety approach uh and also you know we're going to change the mayoral powers to um be a lot more like kind of unilateral a lot more executive um and move a lot of those responsibilities away from the council which was a way to kind of filter in more community voices and, and you know everyday people you know if you have you know one, you know, one guy who's in charge of 450,000 people's lives versus, you know, someone who's in charge of a 13th of that, like, it's still not, you know, it's not like any council member has talked to every single person in their uh, ward, though, I'd be curious who's talked to the most people um, in their ward. But, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think we really lost out on that. And I think that's like the, the big thing that I think about, you know, and, and the theme I continue to see as we have this conversation about, government restructuring and, and all that. Yeah, that, that is the topic I'm obsessed with the most is the government restructuring. I think we were, all, we were all focused on question two, and it turns out the most consequential thing from 2021, not even the mayor's race, none of the city council races. It was just, it was concentrating power in the mayor's office. Yeah, yeah, we, we really missed the boat there. I think that was a, a huge missed opportunity to run a campaign that was a vote no on one. We had, you know, vote yes on two, vote yes on three. Um, the vote no on three campaign uh, for, you know, against rent control didn't really get very far. It was kind of your boilerplate, you know, uh, what's it called? Multi-housing. Yeah, the Minnesota multi-housing. Um, you know, and then obviously there was all of Minneapolis, which ran a, a pretty, you know, um, vicious no on two campaign and then there was yes on one but there was no no on one um i know later in the campaign uh the uh yes on two campaign tried to kind of incorporate some of that messaging but i think it just it totally got lost and i think you know we talked to a lot of people who you know even were like they were like you know sold on you know question two being like a reasonable thing to do but they also wanted to see question one those people existed um, and I think like weren't really being engaged enough on like, and we tried to talk to them about that. We tried to be like, well, don't you like that? Like, you know, you can go to your council member and ask them like about this thing that's very specific to your block and your neighborhood, um, you know, cause that's kind of what's going to get lost in this uh, shuffling, reshuffling or it certainly could right. be. And I, I really think we're on the path to totally losing that as, I start to hear more like part-time council member kind of things and, you know, yeah. that kind of flavor of it's the, the whole strong, strong man thing is very seductive. Like I want to have one person in charge. The reason things aren't getting done is because of inefficiency and nobody knows what they're doing. If we just put one person in charge, things will get fixed. Mm -hmm. and like there, even if that was true, that that worked, there's a huge downside uh, to that in putting all of your eggs in one basket. You elect the wrong person. You don't always elect the right person. Maybe you elect the wrong person and you want yeah. 13 people to counteract that. Right. I mean, and like, you know, I would certainly prefer if we are to have someone who's executive, I would prefer to have someone who is like their like base strategy for everything is like to get as much engagement as possible. And that's where they're going to invest their resources in as opposed to, I mean, it's interesting, even with like this, it's, it's funny because <laughs> some people reached out to me um, uh, last year when like Cedric Alexander was getting uh, appointed to his public safety commissioner position and that they were creating that whole department. And people were like, well, isn't this like what was on the ballot for question two? Like we created a department of public safety 
And like, obviously there's some like hierarchy things where like we wanted the department of public safety to really be like in charge of the department of police um, or police department rather. Uh, and uh, you know, that that's all there, but like, I mean, we saw, we, everyone saw the, um, the graphic of like what Cedric Alexander is proposing, you know, the structure of his department be now and, and, you know, who he wants to hire. And it's like, it's all comms, it's all PR, right. you know, it's like, it's like basically they took uh, John Elder's job at the police because I don't think he works uh, for MPD anymore. And they, they took his job and they created a whole department. Um, right. And it's, it's like, these people aren't really interested in safety. They aren't interested in expanding our approaches to safety. Like everyone who was on board for question two was, uh, you know, hoping to do it. It's, it's instead just like kind of, a, um, what's the term? What's the George Orwell term from 1984? The, uh, it's like big brother. You know, no, no, no. Like uh, when the term for like when you, um, uh, you know, use like a fancy word to, you know, kind of explain something away or like cover something up. It's like it's, it's not or, coming to me. It's not. Yeah, I know. It's not coming to me either. But, if you know, you, if you want to if you want to Google it, I can edit out all the dead air if it feels important <laughs> to you or we could just. No, not important. It's never but, happened. you know, it's, it's a little <laughs> it's a little it's like that kind of moment where you're like, oh, that's a little. Orwellian, like they took this thing that was a real, you know, I don't know, kind of an ideological idea about, you know, how we should approach safety and they turned it into a PR opportunity. And we see that a lot with the police. I mean, that's kind of always been their their game with um with regards to public relations. And it's it's funny to see them adapt to this, knowing that right. I mean, you know, they had to they had to do something about the fact that forty five percent of voters roughly wanted uh wanted to see um sizable overhaul of uh, of the safety system in this city. So some council members have criticized the the comms heavy approach to the new uh community safety department. Uh if that's even what it's called. I have a hard time remembering all the new departments that we have. Uh but I think what they did was they pulled in comms from the various departments, the fire department, police, and that's why they're so heavy with comms. Not that and I'm sense. not I'm not making excuses for Cedric Alexander. But, no, that uh, that that would make sense. It's not what you want. Like right. is the thing that's keeping us safe more talking heads on the news who are gonna tell us about what's going on in the city and issue press releases. It's talking heads on the Witch Life podcast. <laughs> so We're keeping you safe. Yeah, yesterday you declared the topic of the War 10 convention dead. And for context for people. Yeah, I'm eating uh, my words on that one. <laughs> it's May 18th as we record this. Uh, is, why are you eating your words? I, well, you know, the press release happened. And so the the whole thing, you know, continues to broil, roil on. Um, I guess more of what I meant with that is like, I and I, I kind of was trying to explain this to someone. I don't know if they... Uh, you know, we're willing to hear me out at that point, but I, I think we, we have to kind of avoid, um, I guess for, for lack of a better term, the Mickey Morrification of, uh, some of these candidates. I tried, like, I, tried I tried this last year. I tried to avoid Mickey Moore, but he wouldn't, <laughs> he was not, he, he was not willing to be avoided. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think there are people in politics who they really want to do the right thing. They really want to help people. You know, you and I might not agree with them and their approach. Um, I think there are conservatives out there who who do genuinely care about the state of things, um, you know. But then I think there are a lot of people, um, especially now, uh, especially since like 2016, um, who are really just in it to get famous and um, to get attention. And I'm not saying that Nasri Warsami doesn't care about his community and his ward and the city, but pulling stunts like that certainly doesn't make it seem like you really care. Um, and I think like when someone is really just like doing kind of, you know, reckless behavior for, uh, for the sake of, you know, a little bit of attention, a little bit of clout. Um, I mean, do we really want to reward that? You know, do we really want to make that the, the center, especially when, you know, um, you know, Aisha Chugtai uh, has been, from my understanding, at least a pretty good council member, someone who's really showed up for people, someone who's really, I mean, I really, really um, 
respect and appreciate the work that she did with uh, Council Member Chavez on, uh, um, you know, figuring out like the processes behind some of these um, encampment evictions. Like that's a big deal and, you know, something that really does affect people. And, you know, she's someone who I know um, is always going to be behind labor, is always going to be behind, you know, uh, renters' rights, um, really important things to that ward. And I, Nasru Warsami is very concerned about safety, I guess, but like in a very vague, vacuous way. And it's like, why, why even pay attention to this guy? Why not just be like, he's an also ran uh, and, you know, move on. I mean, hopefully that's what happens. Hopefully like this all blows over. A judge dismisses this pretty obvious, like fake charge. I mean, maybe it's not I, obvious, but I, I'm not sure anyone will prosecute this to the point where a judge no. even needs to dismiss it. <laughs> no, I mean, I, like everyone said, there's so much video of what happened. Someone would have caught, you know, a council member punching a, you know, campaign employee. Right. So but, apparently, you know, my vi apparently my video ca captures the t period of time where it's supposed to have happened, and I like followed Ellison's head through the crowd, and I think I can see the head of Nasri Warsame's campaign manager, I don't, I see the Ellison go over into the corner and I don't really see any like sudden head movements that would indicate there's any scuffling happen. No. So, I don't, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, it's like, I, I've met Jeremiah Ellison. I know him personally. Um, you know, I'm not like his friend or anything, but he has never struck me. I mean, he's always like struck me as someone who's very cool and, and, calm and like level-headed and i like i have a hard time believing that like he would just you know deck someone at a convention unprovoked like that seems really really yeah, but here, like, very suspicious accusation on so many levels <laughs> here we are talking about it right here we are talking about it we've been manipulated you know what i'm <sighs> sad about is that this happened so early all of this nonsense before the Star Tribune yeah. could be suckered into making an endorsement of Nasri Warsame. And then, I mean, the nonsense is supposed to happen after the Star Tribune endorsement so we can mm -hmm. embarrass the editorial board and make them retract the endorsement. <laughs> that's how, that's the Mickey Moore game plan. Uh, this is yeah. all happening in the wrong no, like order. They, even with that, like, they ignored so many red flags with him. That's, that's true. Like, he was just happen. a walking hazard that entire campaign and i think like there were i mean i i like kind of in early 2022 just just for kicks i infiltrated like uh one of those groups that's like political the you know one of the groups for like the people who are politically organized behind like the law and order candidates um i think it was the one that was like a follow-up to operation safety now or whatever it was called um and they had much discussion about, yeah, we really shouldn't have invested like any time into Ward 9. Like it was, it should have been very clear to us that um, like, you know, none of our candidates who we like soft endorsed were going to win, you know, that Jason Chavez had pretty much declared victory way before, um, you know, election day. And, uh, you know, we just can't invest our time into goofballs. And, and like, I, you know, I've seen some people suggest, like, Nasser Warsami is an agent of Jacob Fry and all of Minneapolis. And I just, I, I don't see any evidence of that. I think that they've probably very, I think their, their game this time is, like, to block, um, you know, Soren Stevenson and Oreen Chowdhury and more DSA members, essentially, from um, coming into office. I, I think they've, pretty clearly chosen not to invest in um, wards where things are pretty settled right now, like yeah. Ward 9, Ward 2, you know, those are pretty clear. It's pretty clear what people in those wards want, and it's not what they have to offer, and they're not going to waste their time there. So, Ward 10 is a lost cause for them. Ward 9, uh, probably a lost cause. I was surprised not to see anyone in Ward 2, though, because that was kind of close last time. It was close, but you have to remember, you know, like, there was the whole, like, I think older progressives who really liked Cam and felt loyalty to Cam. And then, um, you know, people who, you know, saw a lot of potential in Robin and, and wanted to um, see her on the council and, and felt like it was time for change. And I think that probably caused Ustra to kind of bubble up to, to that number two spot with such a close 
you know, race. Um, I, I think ultimately, like, that war, just the history of it electorally, like, they haven't had a DSL candidate in decades at this point, right? I mean, it was, it's been Cam. Cam was there for 20 years, and now, uh, and they said, actually, we want someone further left, uh, you know, Cam Gordon. Um, I think it's, and, and also, you have to consider also, they redistricted it in a way that I think, like, Cooper is no longer part of uh, that ward. Um, and that was kind of like the, that was like Eustra's base, I think. Um, politically, that's where, you know, most of the conservatives were. It's, it's a bit wealthier than the rest. And uh, I think Ward 2 also expanded into more university area. So uh, Robin obviously is very popular among students. So I think they just said that's, that's just an uphill battle. It's not worth fighting. So it's yeah. time for our human, human interest segment or where are they now segment? Uh, I, I'm always right fascinated by people uh, you're here but uh, where have you been I, I'm always fascinated by people who go away and shut down their social media accounts and decide to become uninvolved in politics I, I don't know if this is a description of uh, your experience but if it is uh, and one of the reasons I'm fascinated is because I'm increasingly tempted to like just burn it all down and I, mm. I don't have to think about this anymore I can do something else. I don't have yeah. to be uh, an obsessive about any of this stuff. I don't have to. I don't have to live and die with the fate of the city constantly. It, it, totally, it, it wears on you uh, uh, during this time. So, uh, why? Why did you go away? Did you go away? I don't know. Why did you shut down your Twitter account? Did you learn anything about your old self? Have you learned yeah. anything about your new self? Do you have new ideas? Do you regret old ideas? What, what's been your journey? You know, um, that's a good question and definitely one I have a pretty personal answer to. Um, I kind of, I think after the election, I, like many people, were pretty upset about the, uh, you know, future of our city kind of being a bit stalled, I would say. I don't think it's ever over, you know. It's not like it's Jacob Fry for another hundred years, you know. I, I think there's still a lot of people who want to fight and uh, there's a lot of people who want, um, you know, a more, you know, just uh, city government with, you know, elected officials who are going to reflect, uh, you know, working people um, better. Uh, but I just felt really angry and I think I felt kind of a despair and, you know, it wasn't just me, but it was a lot of people. I, I think I, but I know for myself, I was certainly like kind of lashing out. And I think some people close to me kind of checked me on that and were like, you know, you realize when you say this, it kind of hurts me. I think I felt like very paranoid to a degree about like what was going on. I got some texts from anonymous numbers that were like not super nice. Um, and that freaked me out. And so I was kind of like, I just think I need to lay low. I think I need to get out of politics. Um, you know, I'm not really out of politics. Obviously, I'm still like following the news. I signed up to be a delegate, you know, I really do care. Um, you know, what I think is like possible might be a little bit checked um, from 2021. I might be a little bit more cynical about like what we can pull off. But I certainly have been proved wrong. I mean, I think, um, you know, seeing some of the victories at the legislature, both electorally in November and also what they've done since. I mean, I, I won't give them like an A plus or anything, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly impressed with like some of the, you know, more like human rights and um, economic justice, you know, elements. I think like passing universal school lunch is amazing. I think like, uh, you know, expansions to um, uh, tuition-free college, amazing. I mean, that I would have never guessed that would have happened. And, and also, like, from a senator who I helped get elected. Uh, I was Omar Fateh's field manager for his 2020 election. These are good things that happened that I had not guessed would happen. I, I wasn't really expecting uh, the Senate to flip, even. Um, I thought it was basically going to stay, like, a one Republican margin, you know, um, and even this year, you know, when, uh, I'll admit when Soren Stevenson announced, I was like, you know, I know that people in Ward, uh, eight, not Ward nine, Ward eight, there's a good number of people who, uh, don't feel represented by Andrea, but I'm not sure that this is 
exactly what they're looking for, but from what I've seen, Soren is incredibly popular. Um, I've seen video and, and read many quotes from him. Um, I don't know him personally, uh, but I've been super impressed with his campaign. Um, I really wish him good luck on Saturday, uh, May 20th. I don't know when this is coming out, um, but I, I have high hopes for him from what I've heard. He has a really good uh, lead um, in the delegate count right now. I, I think like things like that are amazing. I mean, in Ward 12, uh, wasn't expecting Andrew Johnson to retire, uh, but he is. And Oreen uh, Chowdhury is a very, very good friend of mine, someone who I've known since college and uh, someone who I worked a lot with um, when I was, uh, you know, working on campaigns and someone who like, you know, I almost is a friend, but also a mentor. Just, I mean, she's always had so much experience and, and uh, given me so much knowledge and uh, wisdom and like seeing her just like, you know, win people over so much and have such a successful convention. It makes me feel more optimistic. So I kind of was like, I'm more willing to step back in. You know, I think I like taking a step away, gave me some space to be like, okay, this is not everything. <laughs> like, you know, Minneapolis city politics, Minneapolis elections. It's, you know, I can't live and die by this. You know, there has to be more to my life. And there is a lot more. I, you know, I've always had other things that I do and I'm trying to kind of invest more in those things. Um, I know some people on Twitter were asking about the gardening and the farming stuff. Um, that's certainly always been a part of my life and, and has consistently been a thing that I, I do to ground me. Um, Getting to spend more time with friends, loved ones, that's really important. Um, getting more time to just, like, play video games and watch TV and, like, not have, like, ah, I have, like, a million campaign emails to respond to in the back of my head. That's been, like, really freeing. Um, you know, I have a job that has amazing benefits and, uh, you know, kind of gives me a, a real sense of security and also is a job where, like, after 5 p.m., I don't have to really think about it. Um, and that's really amazing. So I'm very thankful for where I am. I wish that, like, everyone in the city could have that. I wish that I could have a hand in everybody having that. And I still probably can. Um, I mean, I think everyone can. It's, it's you know, it's about us. So I, I hope that answers the question. I, I can't really remember <laughs> what prompted this. but <laughs> uh, Well... Apparently, it was a very good question because it prompted, a, I think, of an appropriate answer. So as I get older, I feel very old. I feel older and older every year. I just like I think about how uh, I know, things change. You know, I, things are bad now. They won't be bad uh, a year from now or two years from now. It's not always going to be terrible. Jacob Fry is not always going to be the mayor. Uh, we could have an even worse mayor. <laughs> and I, I will often think that way too um yeah it's possible i mean speaking of my negativity another i i run this thought experiment all the time like what what if sheila had won what if kate knuth had won what if uh, fry had lost i i just foresee consider yeah. the same events happen to jacob fry it, he just like he can blow right past him like it doesn't, it does not affect him. If someone else had won, oh, they would own it. They would own it so hard. And I just wonder if any other candidate, a well-meaning candidate, could have even survived that. Would it even have been better? Would it? Would we be in worse shape? This is my negativity. Mm -hmm. But do you ever run through and go like, what if we had won? <laughs> what would the result of that have been? Yeah. Um. I mean, I've certainly spent some time thinking about that, and I won't speak to like what Sheila would would have done because she's her own person, and I don't I don't know. Um, I think we had talked about like you know me potentially having a role in her political career had she won uh, going forward. We certainly had a good working relationship. We we're still friends. We still hang out a good amount, um, which is nice. Uh, probably the best part of. <laughs> best thing coming out of that campaign is that I made an amazing friend. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I thought about it. I have some like pessimistic ideas of what might've happened. I also have some really optimistic ones. I think, um, you know, on the negative side, I think we probably would have seen um, state and federal intervention in um, 
how our public safety is managed. I just know Sheila is someone who at her core, um, and I think the people around her who she would have wanted to work with at their core, um, don't believe in police intervention and, you know, almost any of the situations that we're dealing with in this city. Um, certainly with encampments, certainly with, um, you know, uh, issues among our youth, um, getting into organized and unorganized crime, um, you know, uh, issues around drug addiction, uh, you know, drug dealing. Um, I don't think that those are things that we would have, uh, we would have tried our hardest to kind of kneecap, um, you know, how those are being responded to, uh, you know, in a, in a way that uses state violence. Um, and we would have really tried to put investment into nonviolent solutions, um, non-carceral solutions. Um, but I think that the state and probably the federal government, because we know that the FBI and Andrew Luger, um, you know, play a pretty heavy hand in, in what's going on in our city right now. I think they would have probably been a lot louder in opposition than, uh, you know, we hear from them now. Um, I remember, because it happened so shortly after the election, uh, when Amir Locke was murdered by MPD. Um, you know, one thing that I noticed was like, Jacob Fry was able to kind of work unilaterally with all of those law enforcement agencies. And that was something that I was like, oh yeah, there would be no way, uh, no way in hell that would have happened with, you know, with Sheila. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have cooperated with us. They probably would have acted alone and left us in the dark and that would have created chaos um, in a way that probably wouldn't have helped anyone, um, probably wouldn't have created a very safe situation. So those are some things that I recognize that would have been really challenging. But again, on the optimistic side, I think we would have had amazing opportunities to, um, you know, implement participatory budgeting, which would have given, you know, every people in Minneapolis the ability to have some say in like what the city puts its money behind. You know, I think most people in the city would prefer not to see millions of dollars go into encampment evictions and, um, you know, purchasing weapons and tools for police and helicopters and all that stuff. You know, people would rather see um, investments into housing of some sort, you know, um, both for unhoused people, um, but also people who are just struggling to pay rent. You know, uh, we had some great ideas about like, hey, like what if the city of Minneapolis started trying to figure out how to make sure that nobody uh, goes hungry, like, you know, making sure that we guarantee food as a, as a human right in this city. Um, you know, I think there would have been great projects along those lines. I think we could have done great things with, you know, creating that more holistic approach to safety, even if other law enforcement agencies didn't want to, um, you know, cooperate, including MPD. Um, you know, we certainly could have tried to push for um, you know, creating a safe injection site uh, in Minneapolis. I think that's something that still needs to happen, um, especially seeing you know, uh, what's been going on with the Franklin and uh, Lake and probably some other light rail stations. Um, I just know those two in particular, I, I hear a lot about mostly, mostly because I, I still follow uh, Jason Chavez uh, and he, he brings that up a lot. So uh, yeah, you know, I, think, I think there would have been a lot of opportunities again to try to have the city be run more democratically, try to, I mean, for certain things like, uh, you know, we appointed a um, department head, uh, is it even a department head or is it like something bigger? Like someone who has clearly a, like a real issue with um, workplace toxicity in a, in a very upper management position, like that would not have happened. I think you were um, talking about COO, uh, Heather Johnston. Yes, Heather Johnston. Yes, that would that would not have happened that way. You know, we would have intervened. We would not have allowed that person to continue working. Um, you know, we would have supported the staff who felt like they were being completely ignored and belittled. Um, you know, in a in a way that was very racialized. You know, we wouldn't have thrown employees under the bus uh, like that. You know, um, like um, oh, I forget her name, uh, Miss Green. Um, the race equity director? Yes, the race equity, you know, that would have been work that I know would have been, you know, supported in, in a real way and not just kind of like a, I mean, I feel like with our city, uh, this is 
something I've thought about for a long time. You know, we have a lot of things in our city that like, I feel like just are there as like a, it's like greenwashing, you know, we have a race equity director, but clearly we do not do anything to support the race equity director to do any work that would promote race equity. Um, you know, we have, uh, these advisory boards that are essentially there to, um, manufacture consent for whatever city staff wants to do. I, I can speak personally to that. I, I've been on, um, not for the city, but for the park board, I've been on an advisory committee and I, I assume they run basically the same. Um, but you know, my experience with being on one of those was, you know, we went in, I think everyone had different ideas for sure. Um, but there were a lot of people there who really wanted to push for something like really new and, and really different. And, um, you know, I think there were some tactics that were used that I don't agree with, but, uh, you know, what I got was that like, oh, the city staff really have a clear idea of what they want, um, or rather park board staff have a very clear idea of what they want. And, uh, you know, they're basically going to try and mold this process to get that outcome um, and say that like, oh, we had a advisory group of 25 community members and they, the majority said that they liked it. So we're doing this. I mean, you know, I think we would have really been taking a serious look at some things like that and being like, how can we make sure that people with these roles around equity are actually empowered to do work that changes how the city functions? Um, you know, how are we making sure that advisory groups aren't just like rubber stamping stuff that city employees want, you know, without actually engaging, you know, everyone in the city who has a stake in these issues. So you know, I think that would have been like the positive would have been like some real transformational change, um, really giving more people a voice. I think that would have been like the the upside. And, and I think in politics, you know, and I can speak to this, like from an electoral side, for sure, but like, giving people like a platform and a voice can be very empowering, it can, it could sustain you long enough that, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe at some point, state and federal law enforcement are like, all right, Minneapolis, you're going to do what you need to do. Um, you know, and, and then we suddenly have the freedom to, uh, you know, we, we prove ourselves popular enough because we've done this work of engaging people and people, you know, are feeling heard, you know, if people feel like that with their city government, they're not gonna, they're not gonna want to change it, you know, so. Here, here's a controversy that cropped up in my replies during the Ward 12 convention. Uh, <laughs> Orin. Chowdhury, who was running in Ward 12 for city council, who was a, she was endorsed at that convention, uh, mm -hmm. basically answered a question about the third precinct and said uh, that it's important that to her that we have a third precinct building. She didn't say, like, uh, open it in the old place. She didn't say where it should be, just that it was important that we have one, that mm -hmm. people expect, uh, like, re a response to their 911 calls. And I think I think you popped up to, like, defend her answer, but I can't remember what your defense was. And so and I think my I question kind of is... regret some of my wording there because Oh, you like... regret your defense? Well, I don't regret defending Oreen. I think like What was you your know, defense? And tell us why you in regret my it. in my experience, if you're you know, running for a DFL endorsement, you know, you need those members to support you. And I, I'm guessing that she talked to enough people who said, you know, I really like some of the things you say about holistic defense, but I personally feel that there needs to be, you know, some sort of outpost, let's just say, you know, be it a precinct or, you know, I, you know, I hear all of the people who have been going to these uh, third precinct meetings who are like vehemently opposed to it. It seems to me that for sure, like a majority of people in that community, and we can probably like, you know, uh, reverse engineer this just by looking at like, uh, you know, question two voting, um, you know, in, in those areas, uh, in those precincts, um, electoral precincts, not uh, police precincts. But, um, you know, I think there were probably people who were like, I don't know, I feel like, you know, maybe there's crime in that neighborhood. I, I don't want to speak because I do not know the situation. But I think that like, you have to make the calculus also that the mayor is clearly not going to listen to any of these people. He is going to build that precinct. Um, and, uh, 
that's kind of like a hard reality when you're dealing with a lot of people who are very emotional, rightfully so. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase this. I certainly don't want to see a new third precinct. It seems like a lot of the people who lived by the old third precinct and the, the fact that the other, um, the other location they're proposing is like right next to little earth. That seems incredibly, uh, incredibly rot. That seems like a really bad idea. It seems like, they're just setting up a great opportunity for, you know, police officers to racially discriminate against a community in our city. Right. Um, so and, from, uh, from a, from a NIMBY perspective, I certainly don't want a police precinct in my backyard. I, I remember, yeah, right. I remember yeah, what I, happened. Oh, all those NIMBYs suddenly. <laughs> yeah. No, no police precinct in my backyard. I don't, yeah. want, I don't want the fumes. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I, wa- I often wonder how much of the opposition is just based on, well, that seems like a lot of trouble to have a police precinct near where I live. Like people who are. I mean, not- it is. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what like the folks who um, own businesses along that that uh, block of Minnehaha, they certainly seem the loudest about not wanting uh, that third precinct to be back there. But going back to it, you know, if you are someone who works in City Hall and you're seeing how the mayor and his staff are operating and how law enforcement, you know, officials are operating, you know, you might have already made the assumption that they're going to build that precinct. And I think like, you know, if you're a progressive who understands how harmful that could be, you are like, okay, what what do we do to make sure that this causes the least harm? You know, and I think it's like an unfortunate thing that we have to do that, but that's like kind of the the real politic of it, you know, like you have to make that like that precinct is probably going to exist in the next few years. And I don't know, maybe it they start building it and then in 2025, we elect a mayor who's like, oh, no, we don't need a third precinct. But, you know, uh, Cam Gordon put out an article that was like, well, what if what if it's not like a one building, it's like multiple sites and they're not just police precincts. They have, you know, various community resources there. They're kind of more like community centers that have an office for police officers. And I think that could get a little hairy um, ethically. It's certainly like, again, I would prefer just not to have the, the precinct, but I don't know. I certainly feel like, you know, Jacob Fry's set up this kind of unstoppable system of government where, and, you know, currently at least has a majority of council members who will support pretty much anything he says. They've been that clear. You know, if I'm guessing, that's where a lot of that came from. Um, But I have not talked to Irene about that. I don't really know where that came from, but that would be my guess. If I, if I was running for office and I was trying to come up with like a, how do I get all these people on board with what I'm doing? Um, You know, and, 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 you know, seeing me as someone who can lead this community, that would, that would be what I would, um, would assume. So here's a, here's like a questioning police abolition question. If people are running around with guns, uh, shooting people, like, does the city need employees who also have guns to like, to step in and say that this has to stop happening? Uh, uh, oh my you're, gosh. You're, we're taking your guns and we're, we're going to segregate you from society for a bit is like, what What do we do in that situation? Does the city need employees, police, whatever we call them, people who have guns to step in when things get violent? Cause there's more guns in our society than ever. Yeah. I wish I had an answer for that. I find it troubling. Um, I'm not like someone who like, like I do understand to an extent why certain People in our community uh, feel the need to have a firearm. Um, I know several of my neighbors do. Um, they've told me so um, just because they, they have concerns about their safety. Uh, you know, I live in Stevens Square. We've certainly had issues here um, recently. I think you should probably ask a smarter abolitionist uh, the answer to that question. Cause I, You're the one I, I have. You're the abolitionist I have. Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, there are a lot of people who can speak back to that issue than me <laughs> okay. um, who would probably be happy to, uh, to talk to you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's very 
it's just very weird how, you know, I feel like everything has kind of intensified. Like, I can just tell that people are really, really tense. Part of me has always felt like perhaps the reason that people feel the need to have firearms isn't necessarily that they are going to, you know, they feel the need to do something malicious with the firearms. It's that, you know, they live in an area that, you know, is police heavily. And like, you know, I mean, what I, I'm not going to like go totally into, you know, uh, you know, conspiracies about the Reagan administration, but there certainly seems to be evidence that they put um, guns in those communities in the first place. You know, um, I, honestly, the thing that probably would stop this all the most is just a federal gun ban that says like, we're going to buy your gun. We're going to give you like twice what your gun is worth to get it back. Um, you know, at that point, if there are people who really feel the need, I mean, and then like also just a pledge to like demilitarize local enforcement. Cause I know there are people out there who feel like that's their motive to have a gun. It's like, well, law enforcement gets one and I don't trust law enforcement in my community. So, but I know there's probably a lot more to it than that. And I don't have the answer because I have not been reading up enough on. So uh, <laughs> do you know, Michael Friedman? He he wrote Michael. a thing. He wrote a thing in the Minnesota Reformer last year where it was like okay. people were like, "Oh, there's no plan for question 2." And he was like, "Well, yeah. here I am. I think he's on like the city's ethics commission now." Mm -hmm. I think he has a lot to do with like a police accountability. And he came up with this like detailed plan where we'd have like a we'd wean ourselves off the police. We would still have uh, armed police who would respond to violent crimes, but we would restructure things. And I can't recount what was in his plan, but like something more gradual to wean us off the police that is less scary, that will reassure people like me who are like, but there's people out here shooting guns off everywhere. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I don't, I personally do not want to own a gun. I just, uh, and I'm not saying yeah. I don't own a gun. Please don't approach me thinking I don't have one. I definitely do in my waistband <laughs> <laughs> at all times. Uh. <laughs> but honestly, it seems like too much trouble for the average person to, to arm themselves. I don't want that responsibility. I don't want anyone to get hurt. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That's uh, Yeah, I mean uh, that's that's what it all comes down to for me. I don't want anyone to get hurt. I mean, you know, uh there was the whole um squatting incident next door to me uh that made the news. Um uh property that uh Beacon Housing owned uh had uh you know, squatters who were there were a number of vacant units. This is what I've been told since that story broke. There were a number of vacant units and uh people had kind of just moved in um and uh while you know that certain it certainly seems that these are people who needed the housing and weren't able to get it um they were also people who seemed pretty intent on you know being involved in some sort of crime you know and i certainly noticed like these people did not seem super friendly uh when i encountered them on my block um you know i would say i try to say hello to people in my alley when I'm walking uh, by or on my block when I'm walking by. These people would kind of give me a dirty look. Uh, I don't know. I'm transgender. I'm used to getting dirty looks sometimes. It happens. It's not great. It's not my favorite, but it's the world we live in. Um, and, you know, there were incidences with, you know, we had some break-ins and we were like, doesn't that person on our, like, security camera look like a person who lives next door? that we like see in the alley sometimes. I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions, but we like knew that something was up. You know, we would hear a lot of yelling coming from the building. There was like a huge pile of trash that was gathering over the winter. We noticed like a lot of needles on the side yard. And yeah, what I was told was that there was uh, drug dealing, you know, people were threatening, uh, you know, each other in the building. I mean, I think people who had leases with, Beacon or had some sort of made a formal agreement with Beacon were were being threatened by the people who were squatters. I feel weird about that phrasing um, too. Like, I mean, it, you know, it's housing. It, you know, it's it's vacant housing, and like Beacon for some reason wasn't filling it. You know, honestly, I think like the real bad guy in this situation is the property management company that Beacon hired that just totally neglected the property. Evidently, they sent a maintenance person out to try to fix up some of the rental violations that they had. 
Um, the building was in disrepair in many ways. Um, I think probably before there were even squatters and uh, the maintenance people were threatened. And so they left and they told the property management company that they were threatened and so they couldn't do the work. But then the property management company didn't do anything. Why wouldn't you do anything if you have employees who are being threatened or contractors who are being threatened? Wouldn't that concern you? Wouldn't that make you say, oh, well, maybe the residents are being threatened, too, or like there's something going on here that we need to investigate? And it I mean, the residents had to, you know, call this to the press's attention. I, I remember Jared Goyette being assaulted, being assaulted in the doorway. Is that the one where Jared? Yeah, yeah, they were pushing. Yeah, they had it on video, uh, you know, and, and they were able to get in and, and get some footage and talk to the neighbors. You know, I, I like my whole thing was just like, I just don't want people like, you know, people I know uh, Southside harm reduction. Um, I've been told like they they're aware of like, you know, that there's drug use in our neighborhood and they, they come out and they do their best. But, you know, people are leaving sharps around on the ground. You know, I know a lot of people have dogs in my neighborhood. A lot of people are walking dogs around and have to pick up the sharps themselves and that you know that sucks there's not like just biohazard containers we put um one of my neighbors put a uh, a uh, empty um detergent uh jug and uh, zip tied it to the fence and uh that's kind of become the unofficial uh um sharps container for our little block Luna, um, we we have to move on to questions from the internet because we promised okay. people we would do questions from the internet. Okay. We're like fifty fifty two minutes in. It's been yeah, I know, and I I have to um, I have to be off at like six ten. So let's uh, yeah, okay. We're we're limiting you to one minute answers here, and these will be okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. What are your top issues for twenty twenty three? This is my internet question. I'm kind of looking for like the next big thing. I think that like some of the. Uh, some of the phrasing that was used in the past, certainly good, certainly true. But I also know that people get tired of hearing the same things. And the more and more people use these lines, and I've noticed this in Ward 6 especially, like the candidates, they know how to talk like a progressive, but I'm not convinced that they like, they know, you know, like I'm not convinced that they really believe the things they're telling me always. And I'm not convinced that they really have a plan for how to implement those things. They just know like the slogans. So I'm looking for people who like are really going to like come in and, and put things in a way that makes sense for our community. So um, I certainly think that like housing is a huge issue. I want to see um, more council members continue pushing for rent control, even if it's kind of dead on, on arrival um, at the mayor's desk. And I feel like uh, you know, everyone's time um, is being taken up, including all of the people in the audience. I'm gonna cut you off with Lisa Goodman when you go over okay. your minute. Oh, time wow. That, that's jarring. So, yeah, <laughs> housing's a big one. Housing and rent control. <laughs> uh, we, we cut you off with the Lisa Goodman sound. You must you must be silent at that time. I'm okay. moderator now. I'm no Pollyanna. Uh, <laughs> I don't have that one in the sound yet. Uh, uh, let me let me see where are we. Eric Moran from Twitter wants your tw Eric Moran is apparently bored with 2023. He wants you your 2025 election predictions. How could you predict 2025 right now? There's no candidates for 25. Eric Moran. Uh, so I'm convinced that Jacob Fry is in 2024 going to try to step up for some sort of bigger position. Um. I don't know that he's going to win. And I think if he doesn't win, I'm very curious to see um, if he stays in office. I would guess that we're going to continue to see, um, continue to see kind of a similar dynamic play out that we're seeing now. I think we're probably going to get, um, you know, someone a little bit older or a little bit more entrenched with the downtown council and that ilk, I'm kind of using them as a catch-all for everything that we know is the conservative side of politics. Um, and we're probably going to see a much younger person. Um, maybe it'll be one of our current council members uh, step up and kind of try to take up the progressive mantle. What I'm really hoping is that we have more coordination among the various players on the progressive side. I think a really big misstep in 2021 was having two candidates with similar but different platforms who were kind of reaching different audiences and having inconsistencies. I think, I think that created a lot of confusion. And I think the ranked choice voting didn't play out how we hoped it would. 
So I'm hoping that it's really just like one clear candidate on each side. I'm moving away from the internet questions because this is one thing I want to talk about. I think we're becoming sure. more pol polarized locally. Like local politics is becoming polarized yeah. similar to the way national politics is becoming polarized. It feels mm -hmm. uh, like people know which party, like un there are unofficial parties in the Minneapolis right. DFL. And like people are voting those blocks. And when you vote for a party without regard to like candidate quality and like, is this person corrupt? Is this person like an empty suit? Or is there no mm -hmm. substance here? You end up with like the Star Tribune endorsing Mickey Moore. Like he's the, the poster child for yeah. like political parties causing like institutional actors to make really bad decisions. Like just because he's <laughs> on your side doesn't mean you have to endorse <sighs> a, a clown. Right. Right. And so that, I think that puts us at risk. The polarization and like the media environment that can like raise up someone who is just totally not has mm -hmm. no business being near power and i th I th feel that risk that the polarization and the media environment will give us just a really bad mayor it, at some point <laughs> yeah i mean the the ultimate problem is just that there's so much imbalance in the mayor's race as well um because you know in every word like yeah we know word 13 is probably always going to consistently produce word 13 and Word seven, though, Katie Cashman seems like a real, uh, like she's really onto something and she seems not like the most progressive candidate in the world, but, but you know, but we can expect Word 13 and Word seven uh, to produce pretty conservative uh, candidates. And they just like, you know, that's, those are the highest turnout wards and they will turn out if they think that like, you know, anything is going to threaten their, their wealth, their comfort um their lifestyle you know uh, and that's really unfortunate i'm really hoping that like someone can help you know someone from those communities can help shift that mindset and be like hey uh not to like throw out a paul wellstone quote here but like we all do better when we all do better guys like maybe we need to address the root causes of crime <laughs> you know if you if you if you want to maintain your lifestyle like you know, you need to worry about people in Ward 9 as much as you worry about yourself. You know? Um, the way we do that is through a police buyback. That's how we handle that. Oh uh, we... Yeah, and <laughs> definitely we need to outlaw those. So <laughs> these communities, are, these neighborhood organizations, they're getting scammed. Like, police buyback is not going to help you. <laughs> It's yeah, like you're just throwing your money away, you know? I think it's a good educational experience for them in how much yeah. the police cost when they have to, like, fundraise for it. It's like, oh, we raised $2,000 totally. $2, and all it, all it got us was, a like, a handful yeah, of just like one overnight shift. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they expect... Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, that. That, maybe that's the moment that radicalizes them, but I hope it radicalizes them in the right direction. <laughs> so. Yeah give you your choice of what you want to talk about. Do you want to talk about does the DFL caucus and convention process still matter uh, based on like the shenanigan shenanigans we've seen this year? Or do you want to answer a question about uh, rank choice voting, which, which is the hot topic? You uh, want to let's address? talk about caucus and convention because tis the season. Okay. Um, you can have me back in September and I'll tell you what I think about rank choice. Um, I think caucus and convention at this point, it's a competency test. Can you make calls you know, deliver a platform that people, you know, who are the most dedicated and most involved in their community think is going to work for them. Um, can you sh get those people to show up at the right time, um, either on Zoom or at your local, uh, you know, elementary school auditorium? Um, you know, it, it's like very basic. And I think we're seeing like, some of these candidates just don't have it. There are candidates who like think like, oh, well, I'm just going to like, forge a bunch of, you know, signups. I don't know that they're all forged, to be honest. I think, like, some people might have, like, gone around and had people sign up on the same iPad, and that could be what's generating all these, like, same IP addresses, but certainly there's some fishy stuff going on. You know, Nasri Warsami decided, oh, well, I can't win, so I'm just gonna, like, you know, have my campaign cause a big fracas uh, and, uh, you know, freak everyone out and cancel the whole thing. Uh, you know, but like, if you can't, you know, sit down for like 20 hours over, you know, January and February, make a bunch of calls to get people to commit to be delegates, get them to sign up online, 
Like these are like things that like if you're really going to be a city council member and get paid over a hundred k a year, um, and have all these responsibilities, and you can't, you know, dedicate twenty hours to make a phone call, then like why would anyone be convinced to vote for you? And that's kind of the problem I'm having with Ward Six. Is I just I haven't felt like anyone's really tried to engage not just me, but like you know, like Tiger Warku has like what two hundred uh, delegates that are being challenged. Why don't all the other candidates have 200 delegates? You know, um, why didn't why didn't they sign up more people? Like, you know, I don't know that any of these other candidates bothered to make the phone calls. I think they had like their small little groups sign up and then someone shows up with a bunch of ballots that have a bunch of or a bunch of signups that are a little bit, you know, off, maybe fraudulent. We'll decide on Saturday. So, Um, I mean, the the sign-up process for Proton Mail is a little cumbersome, and Tiger was the only one to uh, master that application process for all those Proton Mail accounts. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) he's he's the 20-year-old, so there you have it. (laughs) You know, he's a young guy. He's younger than even, like, I mean, like, I know that people are like, oh, these kids on the council. I mean, you know, these are people my age. I'm 26, Um, (laughs) you know. Uh, I think Jason's a year older than me and uh, Robin's 30 and I shine think is 25, maybe 26. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Irene's my age. So like, you know, uh, you know, these are I, Soren is like 28. So like these are younger people. They're a little bit more savvy with some of these communication methods. But like, you know, like if you can't like find someone who's going like, you know, you need a manager. You know, and if you can't put together a good team or even just get some volunteers who can help you set all this up, I mean, like the DFL van, it's a little weird. Um, the, the voter database that, you know, people use to communicate with voters and find voters um, and, and reach out. But, you know, the DFL will teach you how to use it, you know, and it's like I, I just I want people to, you know, understand that, like, if a candidate isn't reaching out to you, if a candidate is like, only having meet and greets because like someone on Twitter called out that the fact that they aren't having any meet and greets and, you know, you're not seeing a lot of evidence that they've been calling tons of people like Sheila got the 53% at convention that she got that like blocked Jacob from getting an endorsement because I made sure and she made sure and everyone on our team made sure that we were calling delegates nonstop for that like two month period where the um, convention when we had like the delegate list. You know, we were calling people every night for hours. We talked to everyone at least once, you know, um, or at least left a voicemail or two. You know, we sent people text messages. We sent people emails. We had tons of opportunities for people to, you know, meet Sheila, um, talk to people from the campaign who are volunteers. It's a it's a prove it's a proving ground. Right. Can you do this big important thing exactly. and organize yeah. people? It, it's like, are you competent enough to be a, a, a council member, a politician, like? They got a lot of money, you know. It's do you, do you have any Ward Six predictions? Uh, give give us your Ward Six. By the time this airs, Ward Six will have already happened, so you will okay. either be proven uh, correct or very stupid. Yeah. Um. I mean, it the convention. I'm going to say it's uh the convention. I'm going to say it's it's going to be a no endorsement. It's probably just going to blow up the minute that like. We have to figure out what to do with these 200 delegates who have been challenged. We'll see if anybody shows up. Honestly, I'm not convinced. <laughs> like, there's going to be a quorum of delegates that shows up, considering that like half of these delegates have challenges and may not even be aware that they were signed up to be at the convention. I don't know how you're going to get. You may be able to create 200 emails, but you can't create. You can't get 200 laptops to all log into Zoom simultaneously. <laughs> And then also like, you know, monitor. <laughs> I, maybe maybe there's a very impressive uh, operation going on there. Maybe this is all. None of this has been fraud, and uh, maybe that one Republican guy was just really on one and and has uh, been like, pulling Tiger's leg this whole time. Who knows? I'm very intrigued to see what happens. Um, I think candidates will be able to show us a little bit more personality, um, but I think it's really going to come down to who's going to actually bother to knock doors and. If no one bothers to knock doors, if no one bothers to do outreach in the summer and fall, Jamal Osman will be our council member for another two years. 
So you can either give me a recommendation or you can tell us about your new bike. I was uh, glad to see you have a new bike. Did you stop riding your bi- a bike for a while? Yeah, I, um, I, I was always, uh, I, when I moved here, I was in college uh, and I uh, only had a bike and my student transit pass that was $100 a semester for unlimited rides, which was really awesome. They should offer that for everyone. Uh, in the city, like, should just be like, if you give us a hundred dollars, you'll get a year's worth of rides for free. Um, that's great. But, uh, anyways, um, I, my bike was stolen, uh, when I moved to Stevens Square, unfortunately we had a break in and I, uh, did not have the foresight to lock my bike in. I thought my storage unit was secured by a key code. Someone pried it open and took my bike. So I have not had a bike for some time. Um, I've also had a car for a long time and Honestly, sometimes it's just like hard to be like, yeah, I'm going to go bike to this thing when you have the freedom of a, not freedom, but you know, the easy access of a car, very little work, very little energy, um, easy to get to the grocery store. I'm actually selling my car too. That's the other part. I felt like I just wasn't engaging with the city in the way that I wanted to. And, you know, I live uh, on a block that has two bus lines and um, I'm just a few blocks away from Nicolette. So There's a lot of bus lines there. I have easy access to downtown, so I can kind of make it work um, with a bike and with transit. So uh, I'm excited to kind of re-engage with the city in that way, Um, see people and interact with people more. Uh, I feel like when you're on a bike, too, there's this sense of, like, exploration. Last night I um, was on my way home with my bike, and I crossed over the, the bridge on 24th Avenue that goes over... Uh, or 24th street maybe that goes over 35 um which is new i uh i've actually never been on it and uh, got to see the view of downtown from that uh from that bridge which is very cool that's a pedestrian and bike bridge um so yeah you know like i kind of like i'm hoping that it helps me fall in love with the city again because you know it can get a little things can feel a little samey sometimes so i'm hoping to find new things and and we're taking that as your recommendation to fall in love with Minneapolis again. Fall in love with Minneapolis again, ride a bike. I don't know what events I'm going to downtown, but I am going to be at the uh, People's Pride Party at Powderhorn Park uh, sometime in June. So go to that if you're okay. queer or if you're not and you want to be supportive. Okay. So I, I would be allowed to go there to the Powderhorn. Is Honestly, you'd probably film like the coolest episode of Wedge Live ever, or at least the queerest one. Um, you have, you have some queer followers who I'm sure would, uh, would be happy to co-host with you. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you, Luna. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been an action packed episode. I think people will enjoy oh, yeah. it. Hot takes everywhere. Uh, my guest has been Luna Zeidner. Uh, this has been the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. Thank you for listening. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the Wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.